Hi, I'm Andy Rominger, an Omidyar postdoc fellow at the Santa Fe Institute, and today we'll be talking about an introduction to the theory of evolution, specifically how this is a theory of chance events and change through time. First, we'll begin by getting a clear working definition of evolution. In the biological context, we mean evolution is a change in the heritable characteristics of a population through time. It's important that this is at the population level because change in a single individual through time is a different process. We call that development. And characteristics that evolve need to be heritable because the process of inheritance allows evolution to act on those characteristics. So with that definition, what we'll be talking about today are four key processes that make evolution possible and some implications for our perspective on the origin of life, particularly the last universal common ancestor and the complexity of life. The four key processes are reproduction, mutation, drift, and selection. Reproduction is a fairly straightforward idea. It's the idea that a parent can give rise to offspring. And heritability is, in, is inherent in biological reproduction because this happens by the copying and transference of DNA, which is the molecule of information and heritability in biology. This means that if a parent has cat ears, an offspring will have cat ears. And you might also know that in organisms, there might be different numbers of units of DNA, different numbers of chromosomes or different copies. And we get around this issue in the theory that I'll present by treating each copy separately. So if an organism is a diploid, we treat each copy of a chromosome separately. And this assumption is robust under the additional assumption of random mating in a population. So reproduction proceeds, we get more and more individuals through time. But one key characteristic of the Earth is that it's finite. And so our populations are similarly finite. What this means is that, for example, in this case of a hypothetical population of eight individuals, over the course of five generations, all the individuals present in the present moment, alive at the present moment, trace their ancestry back to a single individual only five generations ago. This perspective of looking backward and tracing ancestry backward in time is very powerful, and it's called coalescent theory. What this theory allows us to do is make very simple mathematical calculations that are very powerful. So for example, the probability of two individuals finding a common ancestor one generation ago is simply one over n. And the probability of that not happening is simply one minus one over n. Using those two probabilities, we can then calculate what's the probability of finding one universal common ancestor t generations in the past? And that's simply the probability of finding a common ancestor one generation ago, which is the penultimate generation, times the probability of not finding a common ancestor any time before that. Taking the limit of a very large population size, this reduces to a simple exponential distribution, which has very nice mathematical properties that we can make further use of. Before continuing, I want to take a side note about the implications for the last universal common ancestor. So the fact that the Earth is finite, and we have finite populations, means that all of life tracing back to a last universal common ancestor could be an indication that life only has one origin, but it could also mean that the Earth is finite, and that tracing back to a single common ancestor is a statistical artifact, or even an inevitability, of a stochastic process happening in a finite space. This is actually a very well-known property, a well-known phenomenon in probability theory called gambler's ruin, which just means if you keep playing against the casino, if you keep playing against the house, eventually you'll lose. And in our case, if you keep playing the game of finding your ancestor, eventually you'll all collapse to one ancestor. So the fact of one last universal common ancestor is not necessarily evidence for one origin of life, although it could be. We just can't necessarily conclude from the data at hand. So if we all do trace back to one common ancestor, how do we have variation 
among populations, which obviously we do. The reason for this is simply mutation. And mutation is simply the substitution of a new base pair into the genetic sequence. So in this case, we go from a C linked to a G in a double-stranded DNA to a T linked to an A. And this happens in the copying process of DNA. It's a very rare error, but nonetheless, when it happens, it's then passed on to subsequent generations. Mutation is one of the key sources of variation in populations, but there are other processes, other sources, that we won't discuss but are touched upon in the further reading. These include insertions, which is where a whole chunk of the genome is copied and inserted back into the genome. Deletions, which is where a chunk of the genome is permanently removed. Inversions, where a chunk is inverted and put back in. Recombination and migration. All of these provide new genetic variation, but they also in some way depend on the presence of mutations in the first place to provide new uh, variable sequences of DNA. So that's why we focus on mutation as the key process in this video. The fate of new mutants is then determined by two processes. The first we'll talk about is drift. Drift occurs when this new mutant doesn't have a selective advantage over the existing population. And in this case, this new mutant might immediately die out, or it might accidentally drift to a higher frequency in the population. And the probability of that new mutant eventually dominating the population, reaching a frequency of 100%, is very rare. It's 1 over n. So for very large populations, it's very, very unlikely that a neutral mutant will reach fixation, but it's still possible. The alternative to drift is selection, where a new mutant actually imparts a reproductive advantage to the organism or population that has that new mutation. So in this case, I've got a coalescent diagram again, and I've actually rewired it to to reflect the fact that this new orange, yellow-orange mutant, has a higher reproductive rate than the other lineages. This means that the new mutant will much more rapidly rise to fixation in the population, and the probability of fixation is much higher compared to neutral drift. This also means that the probability of a, of a positively selected for mutant being lost from the population is much lower, but it's still possible. We could lose selectively advantageous mutations just by accident. Now I want to take a, an interesting and more nuanced perspective on mutation, drift, and selection. What we can do is actually quite cool. We can create a space of all the possible sequences of DNA and link this space by edges. So we'll make a network across this space where each sequence is linked to another by a single mutation. So here you can see a, just a, a subsample of a four sequence chunk of DNA with links between each different sequence based on a single nucleotide substitution. And then across this space of possible sequences all connected by single mutations, we can overlay a fitness landscape. So fitness comes out of the z-axis, and the height of this landscape corresponds to fitness. The higher, the more fit. Now we can think about a new mutant arising, for example, in this flat part of the landscape. A new mutant would arise, and this mutant would largely be under drift because there's no difference in the height. There's no selective advantage. This contrasts to the case where a new mutant arises, and this new mutant is actually at a higher point in the landscape. Now, the fate of this new mutant is driven by selection rather than drift. It's important to recognize that the probability of a mutation occurring does not depend on the height. The mutations are purely random and uniformly random. But the fate of that mutation, that is what is determined by the height. So whether or not that new mutant is retained or lost from the population is determined by the height of the landscape. At this point, I want to take a moment to discuss complexity. It's obvious that life has 
differing levels of complexity. And it might feel intuitive at first to assume that increases in complexity somehow convey more fitness to those organisms that are more complex. But this is far from universally true. A first caveat to this assumption, or first objection to this assumption, is that organisms with very different levels of complexity are likely so different that they're completely different species. And everything we've been talking about with fitness applies only to populations. It applies to changes within a population. Fitness and selection across species is a completely different idea and is quite controversial. In fact, it's not even fully uh, accepted whether or not it's even a possible process that happens. The other important uh, objection to this assumption is that a priori, any relationship between complexity and fitness is possible. A positive relationship, a flat relationship, a negative relationship. So we can't assume that it's simply positive. But this does leave us with the open question of how did life become more complex? And the answer is unknown, but it likely consists of some amount of almost an entropic exploration of all the possible state space of being alive. Some of those states are more complex, some are less complex. And this exploration might happen through a combination of drift, and in some cases, a local selective advantage. I'd like to conclude, finally, with some real-world complexities in the process of evolution. The mathematical results I've presented you so far depend on some very simplifying assumptions. The assumption of a finite population is probably universally robust. But we additionally made an assumption that populations are constant through time to derive simple probabilities for coalescence and fixation. But we know in the real world that populations fluctuate. And these fluctuating populations have implications for fixation and coalescence. Similarly, we assumed that mating was completely random. This is why we could separate different chromosomes of diploid or polyploid organisms. But we know that mating is often not random. Often there are some individuals that reproduce better or more than others. And finally, when we talked about selection, we talked about a constant selection constant, S. This comes from the environment. The environment is what ultimately drives selection. And if environments fluctuate, then selection will fluctuate. And so we can't assume constant selection through time. But these added intricacies in the evolutionary process are actually good because they can help us answer difficult and fascinating questions such as if a population starts at one fitness peak in a landscape but there's actually a higher fitness peak how can that population move between those peaks when it has to cross a valley variable environments variable population sizes non-random mating can all provide opportunities for populations to jump around this landscape more easily. And that can lead to very interesting evolutionary dynamics. With that, I'll leave you with a list of further readings where you can find more details on some of the mathematical and conceptual ideas that we put forward in this talk. Thanks.